Post, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. General Smith, how much information did we have on Peleliu? For 28 years, the Palau Island Group, which includes Peleliu, had been one of Japan's most closely guarded secrets. No foreign observer had ever been admitted, and several persons who did manage to get ashore in the pre-war years either disappeared or their mysterious deaths were reported. None ever came back alive. From hydrographic charts, we knew the width and outline of the reef, the width, depth, and location of the landing beaches, and thanks to Captain Japanese intelligence reports, the approximate number, strength, and units we would face. We thought we knew Japanese battle psychology and how to cope with it. But on Felalu, Colonel Nagagawa, a brilliant tactician, rewrote the book. Rewrote it in the blood of the American fighting man. Army, Navy, Marine. the Division Reserve. Five battalions have already landed. It is tough. We can see that. A dark fall of angry conflict obscures the beaches. From this distance, it is impersonal. Until you see what happened to the 3rd Armored Amphibian Tractor Battalion. Some who can talk tell us the beach approach is zeroed in and artillery is so thick a jackrabbit couldn't get through. It's our job to prove they're wrong. we come into the ring of fire, we concede a point. It's rough. Some of our guys in the other vehicles don't quite make it. As we hit the coral, some of us don't either. got the entire area enfiladed, and while they keep us pinned down, we get a chance to count the cost. It runs high in dollars and cents. Other commodities don't have a price tag. As we push inward, we find the first hundred yards heavily mined with every kind conceivable. seems to come from everywhere. From steel, concrete, and coral positions, invisible to us, but connected with each other by a series of spider holes. From caves in the jagged coral waste, from the peaks, from beneath boulders. You can't shoot it if you can't see it. We stumble into a deep anti-tank trench and enemy fire pins us down for hours. From the sea approach, it is impregnable. We must fight inland, fight upward, and attack from the rear. Until this nest is cleaned out, other units cannot continue their advance. You spot a coral bunker, it spits at you. 
You lob a few grenades. Nothing. So you call for help. When finally we take it, there are 30 of us left. And after holding it for 30 hours against day and night counterattacks, there are 15. But we hold. Command was worried. Reports coming back disclosed two major gaps in our lines, so serious that any counterattack in force between the ridge and the beach might well sweep us back into the ocean, already littered with the wreckage of our gear. The 5th Marines in the center fight their way to the edge of the open airfield, move eastward and bisect the southern portion of the island. On the extreme right in the southern zone, the 7th Marines find growing rough. The littered beach and the reef force their Amtraks into columns, slowing, exposing to enemy action. Certain elements are landed out of position, and the resulting traffic snarl delays the initial impetus. But an anti-tank trench, similar to the one which tied down elements of the 1st Marines, is a boon to us. It offers a needed source of orientation, it enables us to move laterally into position with some measure of protection. Then, the counteroffensive we've been expecting develops in the form of a well-coordinated tank infantry attack on target area 134R. None of our tanks is immediately available, so the Marines go to work with rifle, Carby, machine gun, bazooka, mortars, artillery. our exclamation point. Three hours after landing, the enemy tank unit on Peleliu has ceased to exist, with four exceptions, which are later corrected at the junction point of the 1st and 5th Marines. But although the individual Marines and their units were showing wonderful initiative and overcoming the unexpectedly difficult resistance, we were far short of our schedule. General Rupertus, partially disabled with a broken ankle and commanding from afloat, was anxious to move his headquarters ashore. But the area of penetration by our troops was so small that General O.P. Smith ashore recognized the possibility that a well-launched counterattack might overrun or artillery might wipe out the entire echelon of command with one lucky hit. There is a time during an amphibian assault when the invader is the least able to withstand a determined counterattack. On Peleliu, that moment had arrived. The 15th of September song, 1944, was a nightmare in nocturne for the officers and men of the first 5th and 7th Marine Regiments. Due to heavy losses of Amtraks, supplies, mainly water, were unavailable, and many a man came to know the racking torture of the dry heaves brought on by exhaustion 
and 115 degree heat. They sprang new weapons on us. They sawed off 200 millimeter naval gun. A strange sort of rocket that came swooshing out of nowhere. We never did find out where and how that was launched. And a new deadly 150 millimeter mortar. A single shell from one of these caused 92 casualties when it scored a direct hit on a crowded area. Command was waiting for the familiar Banzai. But Colonel Tokichi Tada, chief of staff to Colonel Nakagawa, was one of Japan's brilliant tacticians. He refused to waste his manpower, withdrawing them in good order to the hilly peaks and ridges he had chosen for his final defense. On D plus two, we start through this ravine. They are ready. Hill 200 is on our left. 210 is on our right. We wheel left and begin the assault. Tanks and Amtrak attempting to help are knocked out right and left. So, we do it the hard way. But we do it. And spend the next night and the next day under withering fire from Hill 210 across the gulch, mere yards away. Other units find their way barred by this. Walls of concrete and steel four feet thick, crawling with the enemy, and untouched by bombs or naval gunfire. We could do it by hand, but there's an easier way. We call on another member of the team, the battleship Mississippi. We do the rest, and move on until we skirt the damp swamp and find the logical entrance into the maze of mountainous coral peaks. This is Horseshoe Valley. And though we will fight here for 30 long days, we will never capture it. On D plus three, Hill 210 falls. And we continue our advance until we are faced with this unbelievable monstrosity of jagged, perpendicular peaks, coral ridges, and almost unscalable heights. We do not know it at this time, but these are the infamous Five Sisters. Our names for them are deleted by censor. Under this covering fire, we move in. We gain some ground, but not much. The sisters have our number, and will have for 28 long eternities, sometimes called days. Casualties are high. Within a week, the 1st Marine Regiment loses 58% of its overall strength. The 40 hospital corpsmen and 96 stretcher bearers assigned to each battalion are not enough. The 
emergency aid is quickly administered. As we round the point of this cliff, enemy snipers find our range. A rifleman gives covering fire and goes down. Corman and buddies remove him under savage enemy counter fire. We pour it in as the wounded stretcher bearer is helped to the rear. Now the original wounded must be dragged from this lethal spot. Watch the man behind. From four, we dwindle to two bearers. The rifleman, carried away, can now walk. His buddy is not so lucky. Two others help the fallen man. The original stretcher with a new bearer goes on. Our buddies pour lead by the bucketful as other bearers spring forward. We began with one wounded. Five have fallen before he reaches the safety of the rear areas. He and others are on their way to the best medical care the world affords. strategical purposes, the island is ours. But our reserves are all committed. We need reinforcement. On September 23rd, the 321st Regimental Combat Team of the 81st Infantry Division, United States Army, comes aboard. Their victory at Anguar has sharpened them. And in four days, they seal off the northern end of the 900 by 400 yard maze of coral hills, caves, and valleys called the Umbrogal Pocket. The Umbrogal Pocket, 36,000 square yards of unbelievable resistance. First encountered on D plus two, we will still be fighting here on D plus 22. Any rational man would have surrendered. Colonel Nakagawa was not a rational man. He still had 6,000 troops, and they would fight to the death. To clear the peaks of underbrush and reveal enemy positions, Marine planes drop napalm on the sisters, brothers, Baldy, 100, Walt and Boyd Ridges, and other specified targets. Wheels down for takeoff. Wheels down for bombing. Wheels down for landing, rearming. And then repeat the cycle. Shortest bomb run in history. More spectacular than effective. Their battle summary to be captured at a later date will say, since perfecting a fire defense, we have suffered no casualties. When the flames have died, they run out of their caves and reman their weapons. There is Walt's Ridge, better known as Bloody Nose. It commands the height, dominating the supply line on the east and Horseshoe Valley on its left. Twice on September 19th, the Marines assault Walt's Ridge. The second attack carries to a ridge top below the main elevation. From above and from the five brothers across Horseshoe Valley comes withering fire. The following day, reinforced and following the tanks, we move forward to the jump off line. And once again, we are unsuccessful. Round three, all his. On the morning of the 22nd, round four. In the afternoon, round five. He has rocked us back on our heels, and for 11 days we will call time out to fight elsewhere. Bloody Nose is his. By October 3rd, successes on the northern sector of the pocket make a combined action possible. Artillery is zeroed on the five brothers. Flames drop 
napalm to keep him in his caves. While the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, storm upward on Walt Ridge to engage the enemy in round seven for the capture of Bloody Nose. Simultaneously, the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, storms peaks one, three, four, and five of the sisters. K Company, 7th Marines, with tank support, slugs its way into Death Valley to attack peak number two. They are driven back. Enemy fire from every direction forces the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, from the other peaks. And the withdrawal and consolidation is effected 100 yards from the original morning assault positions. But round seven of the battle for Walt Ridge, Old Bloody Nose, goes to the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, by a knockout. After six attempts, the Marines had made it. And this time they stayed. Heaven, high water, and you know what, we're not going to dislodge it. On October 15th, D-Day plus 30 days of incessant battle, the relief of the Marines begins. The 1st, 5th, and 7th Marine regiments have sustained reductions of 50% of their overall strength. They have fought for and won the island, Hill 140, Ridge 3, Baldy, Boyd Ridge, Boyd Draw, the Three Knobs, Hill 100, Hill 120, Gesebus Island, and many others. To the 81st Division, United States Army, they leave the remainder of Umbrogel Pocket, which includes the Five Sisters, Horseshoe Valley, the Five Brothers, Wildcat Bowl, Death Valley, and the China Wall. But as command surveyed the wreckage of Japanese equipment, we were thankful that the enemy had employed it badly. If they had concentrated all their available artillery fire on the beaches, very few would have lived through it. We thank the good creator that they did not. On the faces of the hills, the deep scars of battle. But the vegetation of time will cover these until no trace remains. On the faces of the men, the deep lines of ordeal. But the years of peace will fill and relax them. In the valleys, on the beaches, atop the crest, lies the wreckage. But all this can be salvaged, remolded to more useful purposes. In the bosom of the earth lie the men, but not their spirit. With their magnificent effort, they indicated their desire. Their proxy was left in our keeping. your host, General Holland M. Smith, former Commanding General, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. The assault on Iwo Jima came as a smashing climax to the 16-month drive that carried the amphibious forces of the United States across the Central Pacific to within 660 nautical miles of Tokyo. The heavily fortified island, lying midway between the Marianas and the heart of the Japanese homeland, had assumed such strategic importance that its rapid seizure became imperative. Evo had to become an operational United States base. Like clockwork, our assault waves hit the beach at regular intervals. 
Even the ocean cooperates. After yesterday's storm, it is almost placid. Those in the first waves are elated that resistance is so light. Some of us feel that for the first time, a pre-invasion barrage has really knocked out guns, emplacements, and personnel. At headquarters, we were keeping our fingers crossed. For an hour, we had met very light resistance. Volcanic ash slows our charge to an ankle-deep walk, a laborious crawl. And then, when General Kurabayashi feels that there is enough target on the beach to result in real damage, our progress really slows. Enemy artillery is zeroed in on our positions. The landing craft pull out. We dig in. Those who can. They've caught us, but good. For several hours, virtually no craft are able to get ashore through the inferno of shelling. But tactically, the Japanese had made a mistake. The time which set up the ambush had enabled us to get bulldozers, tanks, and artillery ashore. It went to work. Bulldozers dig down for bedrock and tank traction. Landing mats, purposely brought ashore in the first supply load, do their bit. Late in the afternoon, the reserves come in through the terrible fire, grimly taking their losses. Some of them stay to fight. Some of them stay. Others go right back. Today, the medics will administer hundreds of pints of blood. More than 5,000 pints will be administered to the landing force during the campaign. The 4th Division on the right was pinned down from Quarry Ridge. One battalion was depleted by 50%. Another company lost five of its six officers. made better headway. They struck across the narrow isthmus by noon, and that night it crossed the southern part of airfield number one. landing to the capture of airfield number two is measured in days, fighting days. Nine days later, it is still under enemy fire as the strips are repaired. On February 26, when two planes from Marine Observation Squadron 4 land, it is still under fire. It is weary work. 
It is monotonous in its pattern. Marines advance in the open to be shot at by an unseen enemy. Five times they drive us off of this hill. We come back six. On D plus five, Major General Harry Schmidt, commanding general of the 5th Amphibious Corps, closes his headquarters on the Auburn and assumes command on shore. You walk along. You hear voices beneath your feet. The entire island is honeycombed with caves and tunnels. One is over 800 yards long and contains two Japanese battalion command posts, electric lights, and an elaborate communication system. Tunnels run completely under the airfield, connecting positions hundreds of yards apart. We smoke them out. over the mind approaches. In some sections, tanks cannot follow until demolition teams locate and disarm the danger. Some try it anyway. It does not pay. When the field is clear, they cover our approach. follow as the situation dictates. A machine gun spits. We toss a grenade. Bullseye. It is not enough. We try a 105 millimeter howitzer. 96 of these will fire almost a quarter of a million rounds at the rate of 6,600 per day. It looks good, but we know it did not penetrate the three to five feet of concrete and steel. 48 of these will fire 5,000 rounds per day. We call up a flamethrower. We add a rifle grenade for good measure. We mix and stir. So does the enemy. Look, you America, at the land your sons must conquer. Search as their eyes must search and spot, if you can, the pit, the cave, the camouflage, where death is waiting. For until you find it, and capture it, and silence it, it will explode its violence among you. How do you ask, can that son of few summers, with his kindness, his gentleness, how can he advance in the face of such concealed savagery?
What is his strength? It is his training, the best that our country can devise. It is his knowledge of his weapons and their use. It is his confidence. He has studied the enemy's fighting habits and he knows how to overcome them. It is his faith in his comrades and his just cause. It is his indoctrination. He understands the basic principles for which he fights and the need for the victory. As you follow him in his capture of evil, it will add new measures to your respect for him. This man is your son. As we fight toward the northeastern portion of the island, emergency resupply of ammunition, medical supplies, and radio gear is made by marine and army transports. 78 tons of critical material as well as our mail are airdropped during the operation. Assault units landed with six days supply of water. Engineers put water distillation units into operation. Sump pits dug in the beach yield hot water at 137 degrees. The high sodium sulfate content necessitates frequent cleaning of equipment. Intake lines placed in the surf are often washed away by violent sea action. Despite these difficulties, the water supply does not become a serious problem. On B plus 12, air evacuation of casualties begins. 2,449 will be handled without a single fatality in flight. Others are sent by hospital ship. On March 4, we see some of the first fruits of our labor. A crippled B-29 makes its emergency landing. Two weeks ago, he would have had to ditch at sea. Before the end of the war, roughly 20,000 crewmen in crippled planes will make their emergency landings here. American possession of Iwo Jima will save more lives than it will cost to capture it. As our perimeter is expanded, so are communications. These can play havoc with the wire, but precautions are taken. In other areas, they go overhead. When they are completed, the Marine in combat is only four switchboards and mere seconds away from a talk with the commanding general. Such conversations are extremely rare, but the conveyors of the possibility exist. On the battle line, we find a stubborn pocket of resistance. These can launch 20 rockets at a time, 640 pounds of TNT in a single barrage, and the maximum range, 250 yards. Their strength is mobility. Roar up, unload the rockets, then roar away before enemy artillery finds the range. Some are lucky. This one is not. And so it goes. 10, 16, 22, 30, 36 days.
On the night of 25-26 March, with a skill unbelievable to us, the enemy bypasses our sentries and strikes the rear areas, occupied mostly by non-combat personnel. The fighting and confusion rage until dawn. When the main body of enemy is wiped out, with it goes the last organized resistance on Iwo. This is Suribachi. We have purposely saved its actions until last. In the jigsaw of victory, each piece must be evaluated, not for its own particular merit, but for its contribution to the ultimate success. Viewed in this light, Sula Bach's capture had no more and no less value than any other segment of the Iwo Jima battle. But it did capture the imagination of the world and it gave our people a great symbol of our national unity. The lower slopes of the mountain and the region about its base are honeycombed with Japanese prepared positions. In all, more than 1,000 enemy positions will have to be taken. Tons of naval gunfire are poured into the area. is painfully slow. Because of minefields and heavy anti-tank fire, our tanks find the going rough and eventually impossible. The regiment's average advance on D plus one is 200 yards. From Surabachi's 556 foot crest, the Japanese can observe our every move and disposition. Their fire is heavy. Accurate. Deadly. Airstrikes and naval gunfire drive the enemy deep into his caves and dugout tunnels. When the air and naval action ceases, when the barrage is lifted, back he comes. They were diabolically clever, the best we faced. They would allow us to overrun their concealed positions and then fire upon us from the rear. On D plus two, we get through to its base. On D plus three, we push along both shores and surround it. Casualties have depleted and our ranks are dangerously thin. Early on the morning of D plus four, our patrols begin searching for a way to the top. I felt it before I could see it. Something electric passed down the mountain, stiffening the men, 
giving them new heart. I looked up and there it was, that tiny speck of red, white and blue, tied to a piece of Japanese pipe and fluttering from the gaunt crest. Mr. Forrestal, then Secretary of the Navy, was standing beside me. Solemnly, he turned and said, the raising of that flag on Surabachi means the Marine Corps will live for the next 500 years. It was a magnificent tribute. Later, we decided to hoist a larger flag. It could be more easily identified. This second flag raising resulted in the well-known picture. As the nation gazes upon this magnificent memorial that has become a symbol of our unity of purpose, its meaning is as different as the person who beholds it. To one, it is achievement, thrown to its highest crest by unified inertia, motivated by thousands, flung up the scarred slopes by diminishing hundreds, and secured by two score. To a second, it is determined protection of the oppressed, projected beyond the present into limitless futures. To some, it is effort. Anguish turmoil convulsed to a high pyramid of faceless impersonality. To others, sacrifice. Distaff raised in a righteous cause. To still others, it is valor, refined in the crucible of strife. To me, it is hope. For wherever that flag is unfurled, men and women are striving to bring personal freedom and spiritual liberty to their highest perfection. To everyone, it is the same. Its outlines are seen with the eye. To everyone, it is different. Its meaning is seen with the heart.